So there are many reasons that I became a writer. One of the major ones is that I would never have to do something like this. <laughs> Expose myself to all of you, 420 of you, and those online. <clears throat> I'm a perfectionist and a scaredy cat. Those two qualities make for great writers. Perfectionist meaning I could have my failures privately in my own little office, and a scaredy cat meaning I wouldn't have to confront anybody. I could hide behind my characters. When I was choosing my creative path, I had friends who were going to be opera singers and tennis stars and pianists and actors, and they had to take their bodies right out there and expose themselves. Not me. I could go hide in my office. I could create my stories. I could put them in the computer. I could send them to an editor, and nobody even needed to know that I had finished and I had sent them out. Now, there's another reason that I became a writer, which is that I am the child of a writer. My father was a political columnist. He wrote a column with his brother three times a week, that hit 25 million readers at the top of his fame. We lived in Washington, D.C., and when I opened the back door, I would hear this sound, rat-a-tat-tat, and it was just like gunshots in the house. And it was my father on his old Underwood typewriter. I lived with five brothers and no sisters, and my mother, and my father had a sign on his door that said, please don't knock unless you're bleeding. <laughs> my brothers say I made it up, and I tell them I'm a fiction writer. <laughs> but the emotional feeling was, don't bother him, don't get near him. He was a brave writer. He put out his opinion about the world, the President, the Supreme Court, the Congress, three times a week. It was not the age of the Internet. He did not get feedback from Twitter and Facebook, but he got letters to the editor saying this man is a total fool. He got letters from people saying you have to do something else with your life. He even got calls from editors saying, back off. We got bomb threats and one time a man broke into the house. He was a very brave writer. Remember, I'm a scaredy cat. The last thing I wanted to do was that kind of writing. So I decided I was going to be a fiction writer, and I was going to tell stories. Now, if you're going to be a fiction writer, the first thing they say to you is, write what you know. So I go right to the heart of what I knew, and I'll tell you a story. In the weekends, we would go out to the country around Washington and stay with friends who rented houses. So one weekend, my father and mother and the boys and I took our two beagles, Laddie and Spotty, and we went out to this country house. And in the morning, my father put on his silk dressing gown and he opened the door and he let the dogs out. Not long after, we heard what we thought were gunshots. And then we heard the squealing of Scotty as he came running back across the field towards us. We went out on the porch, myself, my father, my brother Ian. And walking towards us was a man carrying something. <clears throat> it turned out to be a rifle. And swinging from the barrel of the rifle was our dead dog. And the man walked up to the porch where my, man, my father was standing in his silk dressing gown, and the man was in his muddy overalls, and the man pulled his gun back like that, and Laddie dropped to the ground dead. And the man said, this dog shot. This dog chased two of my chickens to death. And my father said, you didn't have to shoot him. We would have paid for the chickens. 
And Ian beat on Daddy's side and said, shoot him, Daddy, shoot him. He killed Laddie. That pain, all of that pain and all of that exposure of what happened to my family went into one of my books. Now, <clears throat> when my father turned 57, he was diagnosed with leukemia. And he got brave again. And he wrote a memoir from the heart. And in that memoir, he profiled each of us six children. And about me, he said, I worry that Elizabeth will run out of family and friends before her talent comes to full flower. <laughs> My uncle put it much more baldly. He said, every time Elizabeth writes a book, it's like dodging a bullet. <laughs> My mother got the bullet right in her chest. I wrote a novel about two teenage boys whose father died of a blood disease, and after he died, they discover their mother's an alcoholic. I wrote the book without telling my mother I was writing it. I sent her the first published copy, and I said, Dear Mummy, I started this out of anger, but I ended it understanding. Please write me a letter about it. Because in our family, we didn't confront. We wrote about things. My mother called me up and said, I'm coming to see you. I said, please don't. <laughs> she said, I'm coming to see you. We spent six hours together. We cried. We got angry. We talked about the childhood I had had, the childhood she had thought she was giving me. And in the end, she said, I understand why you wrote it, I just don't understand why you published it. And then I was silent. And she said, I do understand. I was married to a writer. So you expose your family. Be careful, don't marry a writer. <laughs> the other way you expose yourself is if you follow your creative urge, as so many speakers have talked about today, you may go in places where publishers don't want you to go. I wrote a work of fantasy when nobody was reading fantasy, believe it or not. And then the came, time came when I was supposed to write a third sequel to that fantasy, and I decided I wanted to write a, a book of historical fiction. And my publisher said, nobody's reading historical fiction. Don't do that. Write the sequel to the fantasy. But I have to follow where my creative urges take me. So I walked into this uh, museum in Bennington, Vermont. And in the museum, I found my next book. It was an exhibit of photographs by the great Lewis Hine, the child labor photographer. He took pictures of children working in this country from 1910 to 1917. There was a child on the wall who drew me. She, let me describe her to you. She had a beautiful face, world-weary wise. She was dressed in a gingham smock that was covered in grease. Her feet were covered in grease, and they were barefoot. She was working in a textile mill. She was leaning against the spinning frame, which was as wide as this room. And she was leaning against it as if it were her best friend. And it was her best friend because she spent 12 hours a day, six days a week with this spinning frame. She was a bobbin doffer. She took off these spools covered with white thread, very heavy, took them off and replaced them with an empty bobbin. 12 hours a day, six days a week, for $2.50 a week. Every time that she had to stop the machine to doff the bobbins, the machine went on the slack pulley, which meant her mother was not paid. Her hair was tied up in what looked like an, a Victorian coif. The reason was too many of these little girls had had their heads scalped by the machine and so they tied her hair up so she wouldn't be scalped. I wrote the book. 
It was in copy editing. The book, I made up the character, but when it went into copy editing, I said, I have got to find out who that little girl was. I have got to pull her out of the dustbin of history. And I did. Her name was Addie Card. She had been in the spinning room with Lewis Hines, so he couldn't hear her when she said her name. I restored her in the Library of Congress. I met her granddaughter. I met her, grand her great-grandchild. They didn't even know this picture had been taken. I showed them Addie in a 1998 U.S. postage stamp that was commemorating child labor laws. I showed them a picture of her in a Nike ad in that little gingham smock decrying child labor around the world. The whole time I was doing this, my creative wheels were turning again, and I suddenly thought, I know more about Addie than I do about my own mother's childhood. This is what I'll do. I'll write a memoir, a whole new form. I don't care. I don't know how to do it. I'll learn, and I'll restore my mother. I'll make it up to her for having written the book about her alcoholism. My mother grew up in Gibraltar. It's a little rock on the end of Spain. She was a British citizen. She was evacuated at the age of 14, right up the English Channel, as the British Expeditionary Force was being taken across the Channel. She went right through that historic moment. She graduated from a convent school in England at the age of 16. She spent the summer in Yorkshire, England, with a friend in a big old baronial castle. And the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1942 said, we need that castle for our troops. So they, the family gave a party, big party. My mother's 16. And they invited three Americans to the party. My father couldn't get into the American army because he had high blood pressure and asthma. So he was training in York with the King's Royal Rifle Corps. Bring him over. My 16-year-old mother sat next to my 28-year-old father, and they fell in love. My mother went and did secretarial work, and she ended up as a decoding agent for the British Secret Service, MI5, at the age of 17. She married my father at the age of 18 in June of 1944 in the middle of a V-1 rocket attack. Those were the pilotless rockets that Hitler sent over. My father was a parachutist by that time. He dropped behind enemy lines into France, and while he was there, and she was still working for the Secret Service, she had a miscarriage, and she lost her first child in the middle of a V-1 attack. My father came out of France. They were together for three weeks. She got pregnant again. And she had to get to America before that pregnancy became too advanced. And so she got on a boat at the age of 18, pregnant with my brother Joe. She crossed the North Atlantic in a troop ship in December of 1944 in convoy, dodging U-boats, in order to end up in a country where she knew not one person. This was a story for the ages. This was a wonderful love affair. My mother was dying as I began to tell this story. So the story talks about her beginning and her ending. It's a memoir. I wrote it. I rewrote it. I rewrote it and I sent it to the agent a month ago. And she wrote me back and she said, you did a brilliant job in the beginning, and I love the ending. Where's the middle? Where's your childhood with this mother? And I said, no. That's what I didn't want to write about. And she said, you cannot write a memoir if you're hiding something. Time to expose myself again. So, Red Smith, who was a terrific sports writer, said, you know what? 
Writing is so easy. You just sit down at the typewriter, open a vein, and bleed <laughs> onto the page. And he was right. So now you've heard all the ways in which I have to expose myself as a creative person. You must be wondering, why do I keep doing it? Cheryl Strayed, who was the great memoir writer who wrote Wild, she said once, there is an ache inside me that is only soothed by writing. That's why I do it. That's why I expose myself on the page and on the stage. Thank you.